You know, I don't normally share my lunchtime stories with you, but I'm going to today. Uh, because we had the privilege of having lunch at Ichuban Buffet, if you've been there in Collierville. Uh, but the best thing about it is we got to eat with Tom Waycaster and uh, our girls, two of our girls, and then David also went with us. And I brought all that up to say this, Tom had his first try of sushi today at lunch. And I loved it because, uh, you know, I could have never talked him into trying it. But now he knows what I've been dealing with for all of their lives is, come on, Dad, come on, Dad, come on, Dad. So they talked Tom into trying sushi for the first time. And I'll let him tell you how he liked it. Um, but I will tell you what he said. He's now said he's had sushi twice, a first time and a last time. <laughs> so if you need anything from Tom, you just send uh, my daughters up there and he'll give in a, finally. <laughs> James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Eliminating human wisdom. Eliminating man's wisdom. In chapter 3, starting with verse 13, the Bible says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. There's some important words there. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, as a preacher, sometimes you have the choice. Here's a choice. We could go the negative route and talk about what... Uh, heavenly wisdom is not or we could go the positive right and talk about what wisdom from above is well we're going to go the negative route <laughs> this afternoon and talk about what it is not and once we find out what it is not how we can help eliminate it from our life so that we can have the wisdom that comes from above now i realize at least i'm pretty sure it's the case that verse 13 starts out with a rhetorical question. Look at it again. Who is wise and understanding among you? I realize it's rhetorical. But what if it wasn't? And I don't, everybody wake up and listen to this point. Because I don't want anybody doing what I'm getting ready to say. Cedric, are you still awake? All right. What people don't know is that Cedric gets off of work about 7 o'clock in the morning. On Sunday mornings. And then he comes to worship. Uh, and stays awake better than... Well, some of you, I won't mention any names. But anyway, that's why I called Cedric out. And plus, I won't have much longer to do that. So I'm going to do it every chance I get. But uh, I don't want you half listening and, and do what I, what I suggest here. But just imagine if this was not a rhetorical question. And I said, who is wise and understanding among you? Just stand up if you are. Don't. But just stand up if you are. And everybody, well, you know what? I'm pretty wise and I'm pretty understanding. I think I'll just stand up and uh, let everybody see just how wise and understanding I am. And then in any given assembly, everyone who is wise and endued with knowledge would, would stand, at least uh, in his own mind, if he or she was, then he would stand. And then the next part, watch what it says. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And then so now I'm standing up because I'm, I'm so wise and understanding. And then I find out, well, the preacher's going to call me out and he wants proof. <laughs> He's just not going to take my word for it. And then so the next thing, well, show me your good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Well, then I got to find out. I've got not only to say that I am this thing, I've got to prove that I am these things. Well, you might begin to sweat at that point because you realize that he's not just going to take our word for it. Then the following qualifications are given, and um, many would sit in any assembly. Here are the qualifications. If you want to know, 
All right, do I have wisdom from above or do I have human wisdom? He tells us how to answer that question. Look at verse 14. If you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, he says, don't lie against the truth. Now, if I'm standing up in an assembly because someone said, whoever's wise and understanding, please stand. And then I realize, well, I'm envy, envious, bitterly, and I'm self-seeking. And the preacher's looking at me and knows it and looks right at me and says, Mark, don't boast. Don't lie against the truth. I know and God knows what you truly are. This wisdom, verse 15, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and then that word demonic. And so we can ask ourselves already, do I have human wisdom, man's wisdom, or do I have wisdom from above? We've already answered that. We can, we can really be honest with ourselves and say, well, you know what? Do I put my own desires first, my own needs first? Uh, Tom was trying to put the needs of other people today. He wanted to make my girls happy, so he tried sushi. He made a sacrifice. That's all I'll say. <laughs> he made a sacrifice uh, for them. But we know what we truly are, and so we can answer that question. But our question that we want to answer in the next couple minutes is this. If I have these things, how do I eliminate them from my life? How do I eliminate these things from my life? And this is a, a, a good question. And one, of course, the Bible has the answer to. If you notice in Scripture, and you'll just see this over and over and over again, when it comes to transformation, there's first a tearing down oftentimes, and then a rebuilding. Have you seen that theme throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament, when there's going to be a transition, when there's going to be a transformation, there must first be a tearing down, and then there must be a rebuilding. As a matter of fact, turn with me to the book of Luke. Well, let me just read it for you. Simeon, who was an old man, but it was told that he would not see death until he had seen uh, Christ, until he had held the baby uh, Messiah in his hands, made this statement. He said, Behold, this child, as he holds baby Jesus in his hand, is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. But there's first going to be a fall and then a rising again, Luke 2, verse 34. The fall comes before the rising again. The gospel of Christ, listen to this, condemns before it releases. It condemns before it releases. In other words, it shows me, here are your failures. Here's the parts that you could not take care of on yourself that you failed at miserably. And if we stayed there, how tragic that would be. But then it tells us, all right, that's what you are. But here's how not to be that any, anymore. Here's how not to be that ever again. Here's what you can build on to become what you should be. And is this not the foundations of the um, Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount? Let me just give you Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Most have the idea of what it is to be poor in material things. A lot of us started there. Some of us are still there. <laughs> and that's all right. That's just uh, material things. But we have an idea, perhaps, of what it is to be poor in material things. Even if we have never been poor ourselves, we've seen other poor people. Other people who live in poverty. But poverty does not wholly consist of having just a few possessions. A man does not feel poor until he realizes his need. Think about that. A man does not feel poor until he realizes his need. Back in Russia, um, when the Iron Curtain first fell, several people went over there. And I think the missionary um, that was over there at the time when Mindy and I got to go visit, he gave some good advice. He said, leave all your pictures of your stuff at the house back in America. If you want to show pictures of your families, that's great. 
But leave, leave the pictures of your stuff, your cars, your houses, you know, whatever else may be. Just leave that back in America. Don't bring that with you when you come. And the reason was because you show somebody who is poor but doesn't realize what he's missing out on, he can live with it. But as soon as you show him, this is what we have, then what does he know? I'm missing out on things. You take the Native Americans who were here first. Yeah, they didn't have very many material possessions, but they didn't feel poor. If they had meat to eat, if they had crops to raise and to eat, they didn't feel poor until other people came to show them, all right, this is your idea of poverty. This is our idea of poverty. And we're saying to you that you're poor because you don't have what we have. Said all that to say this, the lost sinner must realize he is without God. He is without a savior. He is without hope. And it's all because of the things that he himself did. Now I know we don't like to point that out. But I'm telling you, every person in here who is a Christian, at some point you had to come to that realization. You know, I thought I was a pretty good guy. I thought I treated people pretty well. I thought that I lived better than a lot of other people. I thought, I thought, I thought. But now I realize... I'm still a sinner. I'm without hope, without Christ in this world. And I'm poor. Spiritually speaking, I am poor. That's an essential element of the conversion process. The poor in spirit realize their utter dependence on God and have eliminated themselves as the answer. Now we, we know that, but maybe we've never really thought about just the depth of that statement. Do you ever find at times that you still are trying to save yourself? Maybe in your own mind, the guilt that you had for perhaps previous sins that you've committed in your life and I'm not saying we don't try to rectify when we can. Absolutely, we strive to do that. But you realize that carrying guilt around with you doesn't make you any more saved? Being poor in spirit is to realize that no matter what I do for myself, I can never be saved without a savior and then and only because of him can I then be saved now that's something that once you realize that it should never leave you that should, that should be a thing that never leaves you that moment or that time when you realize I've got no hope and there's nothing that I can do about it on my own to change that. I'm helpless. But Jesus made the way. And so only because of him and the precepts that he left for me to obey the gospel of Christ, Christ to be covered in his blood, only because of his sacrifice can I be saved? When we really get that, that should change us, not just for a moment, not just while we're down in the water, and not even only when we come up, not just for the next week or two, or the day or two, or the next year or two. That should be something that should change us forever. And it changes our attitude when we remember that from time to time. Because you go back to James chapter 3, and it should remind us that. that. That first huge principle there. I should not be envious of others because I am filthy rich as a Christian. 
What more could I want than to be in Christ? And I don't put myself above others because I realize my needs aren't any more important than anybody else's. And not only that, I don't look on the rest of the world in a way that says, you know, I am so much better than them. No, I don't think that. Why? Because I realize, if not for Christ, I am them. <laughs> I am them. That's what I was. And without Christ, I am them. And so to look down on another human being in disgust, that's worldly wisdom, isn't it? Let me show some examples in closing here about some people who understood this and eliminated self-reliance. And this is just such an important concept to truly get. It, it, it not only changes individuals, it changes congregations. Imagine having a congregation where every single member putting other people first and has an attitude of humility and oh, it's okay if I don't get my way. That's okay. That's okay. I don't have to get my way. I'm not talking about doctrinal things, but it's okay. You know, it's okay. I don't have to get my way. Hey, if they're happy, I'm happy. Everything's good. You know? Imagine that. Let me show you some people who got this concept. Isaiah. You remember in Isaiah chapter 6 when he was taken before the throne and that vision that he had, he, he, he in essence said, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. As a matter of fact, his actual words, Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I love how he started with himself. He didn't start with, which is what I would maybe be tempted to do. Man, I dwell among a, a bunch of un, a, a corrupt people, ungodly people. That's not what he did. He started with himself. You ever notice when Jesus was sitting with supper with the apostles and said, one of you is going to betray me? What did they do? Is it Tom? Is it Jeremy? Is it Diane? Is that what they did? No. They said, Lord, is it I? And one by one they began to ask, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? That's, that's what I'm talking about. Isaiah starts with himself. I don't belong here because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. I'm about to be destroyed. If we ever, ever, ever lose sight of the fact I don't belong in the bride of Christ. Listen to me. But God made a way for me anyway. If we ever lose sight of that fact, then, as my grandma used to say, we become way too big for our britches. Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7, But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. You think about that spiritually speaking. Without Christ, how do you know how to get to heaven? You see, we owe everything to him. Peter, who was naturally aggressive, he was self-assertive, self-confident. And at times he struggled to align himself with the things of God. Tried to correct God several times. Tried to correct other men <laughs> several times. Jesus said, I must go suffer. He says, no, nah, don't do that. Let it not be so. He says, get behind me, Satan. When Jesus allowed himself to be arrested, Peter said, no, you're not going. <laughs> Tried to fight the whole Roman army, but just got Malchus's right ear. Jesus foretold Peter's denial. What did he say? That's ah, not me. Matthew 26, verse 33. All these others, you might expect that from them, but not from me, Lord. It'll never happen. My way is best, Peter said at first. But he eventually wised up didn't he and after jesus was resurrected and he met peter and the apostles he told peter he said peter when you were young you dressed yourself you walked wherever you wanted but peter when you're old 
Somebody else will dress you, will gird you. Someone else will lead you. And then we're told what Jesus was talking about. Thus he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. John chapter 21, verses 18 through 19. Do you know Peter did that? He got it. He understood God's way is not the best way only. It's the only way. And then what about Jesus himself? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. He emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant. You ever stop and think how humiliating it would have to be to be deity and then to take on flesh? Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes you'll talk to people with disabilities, and yes, we all have disabilities, but some, as we know, are more obvious and more extreme than others. And you talk to people who perhaps are newly disabled, and one of the things that they'll say is, it's just humiliating to have to have somebody else do for me the things that I just used to be able to do without thinking about. People have to open doors. People have to uh, get me dressed. People have to do this and this. And, and some of the things that, that hurts them the most is to them, it's humiliating. Can you imagine the creator of this world leaving heaven and limiting himself to the laws of nature on this earth within a human body Imagine how humiliating that would have to be. He emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he's our best example, isn't he? How do I eliminate earthly, sensual, demonic wisdom? Simply put, I never lose sight of the fact. Like Paul, there by the grace of God go I. In James chapter 3, verse 4, bitter envying and strife for self seeking are present when I think I'm more important than anybody else or that my needs take first priority. If Jesus can do what he did, if Peter can do what he did, if Isaiah can have the attitude that he did, then I also can eliminate earthly wisdom in my life. If you are not a New Testament Christian, this is the beginning of it right here. When we get this key concept on your own, There is nothing you can do to save yourself. But Christ provided a way and said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Today, will you obey the gospel of Christ? Do you believe? Will you repent? Will you confess? Will you be baptized into Christ so that your sins can be washed away? Will you live faithful to the Lord till the day that you die? Or if you need the prayers of the church for any shortcomings in your life, any sin in your life, let us do that for you. We're going to sing an invitation song. Come and have a seat in the front pew while we take care of that need. Let's stand and sing.